Good morning. Good late morning. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Adam Muller. I am the director of the Peace and Conflict Studies graduate programs here at the University of Manitoba. And as we get things started this morning, I'd like to begin by um, making sort of an acknowledgement. The University of Manitoba campuses are located in the original land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Hopi, Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and in the homeland of the Red River Métis. We respect the treaties that were made in these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you this morning uh, my colleague, my genocide studies colleague and, and dear friend, Dr. Melanie O'Brien. Dr. O'Brien is a visiting professor at the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the University of Minnesota and president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. Her work on forced marriage has been cited by the International Criminal Court. She's appeared before the ICC as an amica curia and been an expert consultant for several UN bodies. She received a 10-year service medal for volunteering with the Australian Red Cross and was awarded the Philan Tanidis Award for her work on justice and recognition for victims of genocide. Dr. O'Brien has conducted research across six continents and was recently a research fellow at the Sydney Jewish Museum and a visiting fellow at the University of Lower. Dr. O'Brien's usual role is Associate Professor of International Law at the University of Western Australia. Dr. O'Brien's most recent book, is from discrimination to death, genocide process through a human rights lens. Today, we are fortunate to have Dr. O'Brien discuss her new book. From discrimination to death studies the process of genocide through the human rights violations that occurred during genocide. Using individual testimonies and in-depth field research from the Armenian genocide, the Holocaust, and the Cambodian Genocide, the book demonstrates that a pattern of specific escalating human rights abuses takes place in genocide. Offering an analysis of all these particular hum human rights um, as they are violated in genocide, Dr. O'Brien intricately brings together genocide studies and human rights, demonstrating how the crime of crimes and the human rights law regime correlate. The book applies the pattern of rights violations to the Rohingya genocide, revealing that this pattern could have been used to prevent the violence against the Rohingya before advocating for a greater role for human rights oversight bodies in genocide prevention. The pattern ascertained through the research in this book offers a resource for governments and human rights practitioners as a midstream indicator for genocide prevention. So without further ado, I'd like you to join with me in welcoming Dr. O'Brien to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. I've wanted to come to Winnipeg for many years, having multiple uh, colleagues and friends here. And so I'm really <coughs> excited to, to finally be here. And thankfully, it's not too cold. Um, so I can I can just handle it. I did used to live in Cecil, so I did live somewhere that is very very cold. But that was a long time ago. So uh, you know, being Australian, I'm used to the hot weather. So thank you for having me here today to talk about um, my book. Which what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to pass that around. So feel free to have a look um, while I'm talking. Uh, I wanted to start off, though, by doing an acknowledgement of country. I'm going to do a triple acknowledgement because I'm from Australia. So what I like to do is acknowledge the lands that we are meeting on today, um, of, of uh, that University of Manitoba campuses and Winnipeg are on uh, one treaty, treaty one. one, treaty one lands, um, and and pay my respect to the homeland of the Red River Meti and respecting the treaties that were made for this land. But I also want to pay my respect to the lands that I'm currently working on while I'm based in Minnesota, Minnesota, Makoche, uh, which are the homelands of the Dakota Oyate indigenous people. 
But what I also want to do is acknowledge my home country and the country that I usually am based on, which is Wajak Noya country, and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging on that country. So I currently, you know, today have three land connections and country connections. So today what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a bit of an overview about my book, uh, From Discrimination to Death, and, and what it's about generally. And then what I'm going to do is draw on at least one chapter, and if we have time, a second chapter. We'll see where we get with time, not me when I'm, when I'm going too far. Um, and I, so I'm going to talk about one of the rights that's in the book and maybe a second one if we have time. But first, I want to give you an overview of what the book is about. So, my idea for this book came from the fact that I work, I'm a human rights lawyer, I work in that field, but also I'm an international criminal lawyer, so I work in war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, and being a genocide scholar, thinking about this overlap between human rights and genocide. And I would come across books or book chapters or journal articles that were titled Genocide and Human Rights, but didn't actually engage at all with human rights. And so, I, you know, I started seeing this and, and genocide scholars, actually very few of us are lawyers. And so I wanted to bring the legal perspective to genocide scholarship to demonstrate how genocide connects with the international human rights law system. Um, I also think that this will be useful for lawyers in a way which I'll explain momentarily. Now, in genocide studies, we refer to genocide as a process, not an event, and that's really important, and that's essentially what my book talks about. So there are several authors that have written their own theories about the process of genocide, about the different steps of genocide. And so my book is to contribute to that literature. It's simply a different way of looking at the genocide process, namely through the process as being defined as human rights violations. And I'm going to show you in a couple of slides the list of those violations, so we'll make it a bit clearer in a moment. In the book, I look at three historical case studies, the Armenian Genocide, the Holocaust, and the Cambodian Genocide. And I just want to say that, um, unless otherwise indicated, all of the photographs in the slide show are my own. Um, it's a good way to get around copyright issues, being a lawyer. Uh, um, so those are the three historical case studies that make up the majority of the book. And I look at human rights violations that take place in each of those. At the end of the book, I then look at the Rohingya genocide as a current case study to apply the lessons learned from the historical case studies and to see what we could have done differently with the Rohingya genocide and the violence that took place in 2017 and continues to take place. So the goal of my book is that I hope it will contribute to the literature on genocide prevention in that what I think this is, is a way for midstream prevention to happen. Often people talk about uh, early warning and early prevention. Um, so this goes a little bit further because what it does is it shows you the process. So my argument is that what you see in my book is not the lead up to genocide, but it's all part of genocide. It's part of that process. And therefore, once you see that process is in play, you can say, hang on, we are not, we're on our way to genocide, but we are in the genocide process. And so that's why I'm saying it's a midstream prevention tool rather than an early warning prevention tool. I also am hoping that it will contribute to prosecution for genocide crimes. So prosecutors can use this pattern to make an argument that genocide did take place. Genocide is very difficult to prove in a court of law, and that's particularly because of the requirement of the special intent or dollar specialis, the intent to destroy the targeted group. So it becomes very, very difficult to prove in, in court, and often prosecutors make the decision instead to charge persecution as a crime against humanity because that is easier to prove because there isn't any extra special intent. So my hope is that if prosecutors look at all the facts 
of the situation that they're analyzing and they see that it fits this pattern, they can make that argument in court and say, hang on, you can actually see this pattern happening uh, with what happened in this particular country or this particular situation. I hope then that that will lead to success in conviction of perpetrators of genocide. And in, in that sense, again, assisting judges in making their difficult decision about whether or not genocide took place. Um, the photographs that I've got um, on this slide uh, were taken when uh, it was my last trip before COVID, uh, right at the end of 2019, when I was in the Rohingya refugee camps um, down near Cox's Bazaar in the south of Bangladesh. Um, on the left is one of my wonderful uh, interpreters, and the other two images you can see I've taken with two of the women that I interviewed there. I, I interviewed women refugees about their experiences. So you can see uh, the conditions that they're living in are pretty simple and they've been living in those conditions since at least 2017, some of them since 2012. Um, so the houses are just made of bamboo and tarpaulin, they have a dirt floor and they have a couple of plastic chairs and that's it. Um, they get a cooking stove but they have no furniture. So if you imagine that those are the conditions you've been living in for six years at least, possibly even more, um, and they're still living in those. It's very, very challenging. And actually, since I was there um, at the end of 2019, there have been multiple fires that have ripped through these refugee camps and just destroyed hundreds, if not thousands, of these homes. You can imagine, Tarpaul and, and Bamboo, they would just go up in flames like that. Okay, so back to the book. Um, so this is the structure, both of the book and of my argument about the genocide process. So what I found is, and, and what I should make clear is, I understand that victims of genocide essentially don't have any rights. So, but I'm making an intellectual and theoretical argument. Um, it has been quite challenging to communicate that with survivors because they will say, but we had no rights. What I'm arguing is these are the rights that perpetrators go out of their way to violate as the way that they commit genocide. This is how they commit genocide. I've separated it into five parts because those are essentially grouped together. This is, this is not strictly chronological. I don't want to argue that this one happens, then this one, then this one, then this one. There's certainly plenty of overlap, but there is an approximate temporal order in which it occurs, and it's an escalation of human rights abuses. We start with freedom of discrimination, which to me is overarching and obviously continues to occur throughout the entire process. And that can start, for example, by the use of law, um, by discriminating against people. I'm not going to go through all of these because, in detail because we, we wouldn't have time for that today. And that's why I'm going to talk to you about one and hopefully two of these in detail. Um, part two is where I look at what you could argue are the non-physical violence components of it, but are still absolutely essential to the genocide process. Because the bottom line is that you can't get to part four without having parts one, two, and three come before it. Perpetrators can't just suddenly start killing people. It wouldn't actually work that way. They have to build up the ability to do so. You know, they have to create uh, an, an enemy of the target group. And so what they do is before they get to torture and killing, they start discriminating in different ways, taking away freedom of expression, the right of the targeted group to express themselves, particularly, for example, in their own language. That's also obviously connected to cultural rights. They take away the right to education. They stop them being able to go to school, for example. They take away rights to employment, fair trial, the right to participate in public service. Freedom of religion, I found to be quite significant, and I've written a couple of separate separate pieces on that as well, um, that even if the target group is not targeted for being a religious group, genocide perpetrators still really focus on religion and target religious rights. 
And one of the reasons being that, of course, in, in culture, religion tends to be quite a visible manifestation of culture. So in essence, it's an easy target. Rights to family and privacy. By that, and, and I think people haven't really thought about privacy before, but imagine that you are living in a ghetto, in an apartment with seven families. Where is your privacy? You have no privacy. There's also the idea of informational privacy. Perpetrators tend to get all of the data on their victim groups. Even if you think back to the Holocaust, you know, they were making lists, they were collecting this information. Today, we have electronic data. So privacy is actually quite a significant factor. Um, child rights, I found a really interesting chapter to write as well. And I look at not just concepts like children losing their family, but also things like children actually have a right to leisure, rest and play. And so I look at those kinds of rights as well, which are violated. Um, and, and really interesting things, one of the, um, one of the quotes that I have in there in the chapter is about is, is from a, a survivor of the Holocaust who talked about how they would count the bodies in a pile as a game. So maybe children were playing but the games that they have to play in this context are as, you know not anything that a child should ever have to play. Part three is where we see an escalation and here we're looking at things like freedom of movement and liberty um, and, and slavery. So things like forced labor, um, putting people into internment camps, into ghettos so that they can't uh, move around within or with outside their country. And then, so one of the most interesting chapters, and this is where in my book the chapters start to get a lot bigger, is when I started looking at the right to health and right to adequate standard of living. And these are heavily connected to the other rights, and they're also interrelated. So the right to adequate standard of living consists of housing, food, and clothing. And today I'm going to talk to you about clothing, because it's probably not something you've thought of before. Um, but they're interconnected and really important, and of course the right to health often leads to the violation of the right to life, because you get diseases, you get ill, and you can die. The, the main final part I've got is talking about freedom from torture, and so if we have time today, I'm going to talk about some of the findings of torture that I found, and of course, obviously, the right to life, the killings that take place in genocide. The last part is something that is quite unique to my study of the, of the process of genocide that others have not looked at, is that including the experience of refugees as part of that process. And essentially what I argue in, in that chapter is to say that perpetrators know the experience that refugees are going to have as genocide refugees and therefore it's part of the process you know thousands hundreds of thousands millions of people crossing a border no access to healthcare no access to sanitation no access to food regardless of how well the international community works it's obviously really difficult to provide all that when you suddenly have a million people to provide it for. So we see illnesses, we see rapes, we see um, you know, loss, of, loss of pregnancies, um, we see starvation, all sorts of things going on. And my argument is that that's part of the process and the perpetrator should be held accountable for that as well. Okay, so <coughs> what I'd like to, to, to demonstrate as well is that genocide is more than just killing. So everything in my book, to me, is part of the genocide process. And all of it should be prosecuted in courts, not just the killing. And so I make the argument in each chapter, the crimes that I talk about in this chapter amount to a certain crime of genocide. I also show the connection between all of the rights and that why genocide is a process and why you can't just have killing at the end. And there is a connection between so many of them. So I've got just a couple of examples to show you. So in denial of employment rights, you may think that's not so important, but actually it leads to other even more serious uh, violations of, of human rights. So a denial of employment rights, for example, so saying, um, you know, in the Holocaust, they said Jews can't be lawyers, Jews can't be professors. Um, and Jews can't own businesses, 
So what that leads to in the end, that is the gateway to leading towards slavery and forced labor. Because you take them out of the labor market and then you say, okay, now we're going to force you to work in this area. There's a direct connection between them. What there's also a direct connection between is a denial of employment rights and this adequate standard of living and health. Because if you don't have a job, you don't have an income. And you can't put a roof over your head and you cannot put food on your table and you cannot put clothes on your back. So taking away someone's livelihood directly leads to this denial of adequate standard of living. Remember, housing, food and clothing but also health, because of course, if you don't have those things, you can get ill, you can starve, and those are all related to health. So there are direct connections between different rights. Another example is fair trial rights. So thinking about fair trial rights and the way they take place, it could be, for example, the complete denial of access to the target group members to the legal system at all. It could simply be that they are, they are allowed to participate, but the decisions that are made are always negative for them. They're always contrary to the members of that group. So there are many different ways that in the genocide process, the victim group members are excluded from the legal system. And this can actually lead to other things. So for example, if the trial isn't fair, someone can end up in prison, even if they shouldn't have ended up in prison in the first place, but they're only put there because they're Armenian, because they're a Jew, etc. So there's direct connections with that. It can also, there's even a connection with the right to life, where people haven't been afforded fair trial processes and have been sent to concentration camps where they have died, or they have simply been executed. Significantly also torture, and I, I hope we'll get a little bit of time to talk about that. Um, you know, thinking, for example, of uh, Armenians taken and, and put into prison without trials uh, where they were tortured quite significantly. Adequate standard of living and health. I really think this is an just underestimated how important these rights are in the genocide process. Food, clothing, housing, and your health definitely has a direct connection to several other rights. And including here the examples I give in human and degrading treatment. You know, you imagine you've lost your job, you have no income, you can't put a roof over your head, you're starving, you end up begging, you end up, I just, food becomes such a crucial element of life in the genocide process. You know, stories of people eating bark from trees, eating excrement. I mean, that is inhuman and degrading treatment that has that takes place out of that. It also, as I mentioned, directly is connected to the right to life because, of course, you can starve to death, you can get illness, and when you can't access medical treatment, you can die from that. So these are really, really important parts of the process. And starvation, and, and I've, I've given talks on this recently, but the weaponization of food and the use of starvation is a really key part of the genocide process. It's kind of an easy way for perpetrators to, to kill the target group. You know, it doesn't require weapons, it doesn't require gas chambers, you just simply isolate them and starve them and they will eventually die. Um, I, I would just mentioned that the photograph in the top right corner there, it's actually a postcard. You can see it says Sunbeam Tours, and it's a postcard with images of Armenian refugees looking destitute. I mean, imagine buying that postcard and sending it to someone. What would you write on that? It just kind of blows my mind. They've got that on display in the Armenian Genocide Museum Institute in Yerevan. Okay, I want to talk to you about one of the examples in my book, Adequate Standard of Living, and I'm going to use clothing. So I look at food, housing, and clothing in that chapter, and there's a lot in there. But I wanted to talk about clothing because I think people don't often think about it. And that includes the human rights system. So when I looked at this right to adequate standard of living, there's a lot written about food and a lot written about housing. There's a lot of content coming from human rights committee about housing and about food. 
where they talk about what, what is this right? What, what does this entail? But when it comes to clothing, there's almost nothing. And in fact, the only paper I found, well, actually I found two. One paper was a conference paper that had been delivered in Australia at a conference. And the other one was one that was written recently about um, the right to PPE during COVID um, in this context. I couldn't find anything else about the right to clothing. So I thought that was really interesting. So I was kind of starting from a, you know, not the same base where normally with other rights, there's a lot written about them and you can talk about them. Um, so that, that was my starting point. But I think looking at the role that clothing plays in genocide actually contributes to that discussion about the importance of clothing and the right to adequate clothing. Um, I'm sure you all recognize the images that I've got on the screen there, all of the different markers. Um, and before I get into kind of the, the bigger picture of clothing, what I wanted to say is how clothing can be used to identify people. So our outward appearance can be a way that demonstrates our culture, for example. So we can, people can be identified. If you think, for example, And these are from, um, as you can probably ascertain, all different countries throughout Europe, which shows really how far that this spread outside of Germany as a way of identifying Jewish people during the Holocaust. So I'm going to talk to you about how clothing was used in those genocides. Again, I'm sure you've all seen this. I, I Honestly, I wonder if this is probably the most recognizable item of clothing in world, maybe. The striped prisoner clothes that were worn in many of the camps. Now I do want to say that these were not worn by all of prisoners in the Holocaust in all of the camps. I mean there were literally thousands of camps uh, in the Holocaust system. Um, and actually in many of the camps they did not wear these. And there are really fascinating stories of the types of clothing that people had to wear. So when they arrived at the camps, they were all stripped of their clothing and their clothing was put into warehouses or taken away somewhere. And in some of the camps, what happened was they were then just given random clothing from that warehouse, from those clothing stores. And it didn't matter what that clothing was. So I've come across different stories. For example, a woman who ended up in an evening gown, a black gown with a silver bow. That's what she was wearing in the camp every day. There are people who talk about how important the belt was to get hold of a belt for two reasons. The first one being that the pants you were given maybe didn't fit you at all and they were maybe too big for you. And so the belt was there to hold your pants up. Or secondly, maybe the pants fit you when you got them, but as you were starved, you lost so much weight that your pants didn't fit and you needed the belt to keep them on. People talked about swapping clothes with other prisoners because, you know, imagine, take Adam and I. Adam is much, much taller than I am. And imagine if I'd been given something that actually would fit Adam and he'd been given something that would fit me. That's ridiculous. So prisoners would swap clothing to have something that would fit them better. And there was also, you know, there's trade, there's currency in getting clothing. So, but in other camps, this is all that people were given to wear, these striped outfits. So for men, they were given trousers and a shirt, and for women, they were given essentially what looked like a nightdress. Now you can imagine, you guys live here in a cold place. It's also cold in places in Europe like Poland, and it snows in the winter, and yet this is all that they were given. So when we think about adequate clothing, this is not adequate clothing. 
And I will contrast that to the Armenian genocide momentarily. But the point is that you need adequate clothing to protect you from the elements when you live somewhere with extreme weather. It's really important and it can be the difference between life and death. So if you have inadequate clothing and you are living in inadequate housing that isn't heated and you are spending your days outside in the middle of winter, you can freeze to death. These mittens, which are in the museum in Bergen-Belsen, um, belong to Yvonne Koch. She was 11 years old when she was in Bergen-Belsen. And this was the quote that went with them. So essentially what happened was that a, a woman in the camp knitted these mittens for Yvonne. And she still had them. And as she says, she always thought about this woman because the mittens meant so much to her because they kept her hands warm. They were so significant, it was so meaningful, and honestly, life-saving, finger-saving for her to have these, because of course, if you, if you freeze, you know, you can lose your extremities, like your fingers and your toes and your ears. And, and I have read testimonies where people talk about um, people getting frostbite on their extremities. So this, these kind of little things, just such as a pair of mittens, are, are really important. In this in these situations but and you know and it just struck me how much this meant to her still in all the years after the Holocaust she was still thinking about how important those mittens were so I showed you the striped what are sometimes called striped pajamas in Cambodia they also had what are sometimes called pajamas but instead they were black so what's interesting Clothing was used in a different way in Cambodia, but it was still incredibly significant. Everybody had to wear the same thing. Nobody was allowed to have any individual clothing or appearance. Everybody had to wear these black clothes with the red scarf, with the exception of soldiers who wore khaki, like you can see the cap there on the right hand side. That was it. Those were the two options. Khaki soldiers, everyone else in black clothes with a red scarf and the sandals. And I'm going to talk about shoes separately in a minute. Um, so the idea was that nobody had an identity. If everyone had to have the same haircut as well, even. You know, obviously a haircut is, is not quite as relevant here, but just still interesting to know. So everyone would look the same. No one had any personal identity whatsoever. And the clothes became a really significant part of the Khmer Rouge regime. And actually, so the photograph on uh, the left-hand side there are boxes of clothing that are being preserved in the Tuol Sleng Museum in Phnom Penh. And you can see they've got um, like little black circles because it's really humid there. So they have to keep them in temperature control boxes to try and make sure that they maintain uh, the integrity of the fabric. Um, and, and the first time I went there, though, they just had, as you can see on the right side, uh, just kind of crates and crates of this clothing. Um, but the next time I was there, they had uh, done a really good job of doing inventory and had separated everything out um, so that they can actually keep those. Because it was such a significant part of it. And, and it was this uh, way of identifying the Khmer people that they were all the same, they were all one, and they had no other identity other than being Khmer, essentially. I want to look at shoes as well, because actually, the more I looked, the more this became also quite relevant. I mean, can you imagine thinking about never wearing shoes? And again, here in a cold place, imagine having no shoes to wear in the middle of winter when it's snow outside. These images here, the one on the left is taken at Maidanek camp and the one on the right is taken at Auschwitz. And these are collections of shoes. So remember I said that when the, when the prisoners arrived at the camps, they had all of their clothes taken. Well, that included their shoes, so they took away their shoes. And this also became significant in, in the testimonies that I, that I read and listened to because people talked about how shoes didn't fit them and actually this is where we have this direct connection between rights because for example people would wear shoes and they would have to go and do forced labor 
and they were wearing shoes that didn't fit them and that rubbed and they would get in, they would get a sore and they would have no access to healthcare that sore would become infected and in those situations where you have a lack of sanitation and no healthcare that's something you could die from an infection so having the wrong shoes or having no shoes could even in itself lead to your death and there's a there's an interesting uh, survivor story in my book about um, a young woman talking about um, uh, in the in one of the ghettos how she managed to get a pair of shoes made for her and they were just she said they were more valuable than gold and also if you think about being a child this is something else that children you know, anyone who has kids knows how quickly they grow out of their shoes or their clothes generally, but their shoes. And, and you don't have another pair and their toes would, they would have to cut the front of the shoes off and their toes would stick out, which would then obviously lead to risk of frostbite. So, oh yes, good. I did put the quote there. So this is the quote from Eva Levitsky about how valuable these shoes were for her. Um, and, and I do put more in the book, there's more about the story about how she got these shoes, um, which is quite interesting. Uh, it was quite risky, actually. She, she kind of, she risked a lot to get these shoes. But for her, that says, oh, not like gold, sorry, but like diamonds, um, and worth more to her than anything else that she had. The images that you see on the left there are a couple of handmade shoes so people would even just make their own shoes to try and make sure they had a pair of shoes that was available to them. On the right you can see there is a, a drawing there done by a prisoner who was in Janowska camp in Poland and you can see the striped uniform is represented there very clearly. I mean if you saw that image without context you would instantly recognize that this is a drawing from the Holocaust. Um, but also you can see the clogs. So sometimes they were given clogs to wear or clogs were something that they made for themselves like you can see in the picture here. So just awkwardly uncomfortable wooden shoes and maybe with a little bit of fabric or if they were lucky some leather that they could find. Shoes in Cambodia. Now Cambodia isn't cold pretty hot, tropical. So what they all had were uh, sandals. So you can see uh, down the bottom, that's that's the image I had up before, but they've got shoes down the bottom. And on the left is a rack uh, which has more sandals from the time. Um, but interestingly, the painting that you see there and uh, the paintings, there's, there's not as many photographs um, from the time. Um, but quite a few artists have painted um, after the end of the Khmer Rouge regime. They have painted as a form of witnessing, as a form of testimony to what they saw. So in this image you will see women doing forced labour, working in the rice fields and preparing rice. But you also see they have no shoes on at all, um, which I found interesting. And um, one of the... One of the survivor memoirs that I, I used um, in this book, um, she talks about having no shoes when they had to flee through the jungle for weeks on end and her feet being all cut up from that process. And I think that's quite important. When I interviewed uh, Rohingya refugees, they also talked about arriving at the camps after walking for weeks, days, weeks, and no shoes and having feet and legs that were cut, injured. Um, and again, if you have no, no health care and no sanitation, this can lead to infection. And, and also, you know, if they survive lifelong injuries in some cases. So all of this may seem, you know, you may think shoes are not that important, but actually they really are. And if you think about your own life and what would you do if you had to go around without shoes? Now, you're probably thinking, hang on, she hasn't mentioned the Armenian Genocide when talking about clothing. And that's because it's really different. And clothing was very significant, but in a very different way.
And so often the victims of the Armenian genocide were naked or almost naked. And this was taken away from them. Again, connect this to the right to freedom from inhuman and degrading treatment. I mean, this is a violation of human dignity to be having to live like that. The other thing is that, and I, I said I would come back to this, talking about the extremes of weather. I've been talking about the weather in Poland in the winter, but what happened to the Armenians, the women and the children, so the men were killed, and the women and the children and the elderly were taken on death marches into the Mesopotamian desert, into what is today Syria. And that is, we're now talking the opposite end of the extreme spectrum. We're talking about a desert, we're talking about 40 degrees plus. And so, of course, imagine that you're out in the desert with no or almost no food. So again, in this case, there were also deaths, but not due to freezing, but due to overexposure to heat. So again, clothing, different way, but still really, really relevant. Um, but yes, in a totally different way. Adam, how am I doing for time? I was just gonna let you know you got about 15. 15. Yeah, okay. we, we want some Q&A maybe as well, right. if you wish. Uh, no, this is, exactly. it's an hour, yeah, so that's the full hour. Okay, all right, so we're running off 15 minutes, so I can do a little bit on torture or we can go to Q&A. What, what is the vote? Any preferences? While we're dealing with, I guess we're going to Q&A, uh, while we're well, dealing no, with clothing. I haven't finished. I can, I've, come, I've got a conclusion, but I just, okay. uh, if I should skip torture. All right, I'll, I'll skip the torture. I'll go to the conclusion, then we can do Q&A. Okay. So, my conclusion is that human rights violations are an essential part of the process, and in fact, they are the genocide process. They are what perpetrators do to commit genocide. And because of that, I think that human rights mechanisms should pay more attention to the pattern of particular human rights abuses that are taking place in, a, in any particular situation. Because if they see that pattern occurring that I, that I have shown in my book, then they can say, hang on, we are in the genocide process. And so therefore, that, I mean, it needs to be drawn out. So yes, of course, human rights mechanisms see human rights abuses and call them out generally. But my point is that they need to recognize that pattern and call it out for what it is as being the genocide process. I also argue that all of the things that occur in that process fall into one of the genocide crimes. Genocide isn't just about killing. And all of these components are important and they all fall under one of the listed genocide crimes and should be prosecuted as such. So when prosecutors make charges, bring charges for genocide, it shouldn't just be about the killing. It should, they should be thinking about the other crimes there, such as causing serious bodily or mental harm. So that's my argument and thank you. <laughs> So now we have uh, about actually about 14 minutes or so that we could do uh, a question and answer. I want to thank uh, Melanie for her um, remarks. It occurred to me actually as we were getting going that I had neglected to thank some very important people at the beginning of the talk. And if you just bear with me for one second, I would like to thank the Morrow Institute for Peace and Justice for helping fund and make this event possible. Jason Brennan in particular for dealing with many of the logistical issues. I wanted to thank Peace and Conflict Studies um, and, and Susan Ducharme in particular for helping uh, on, on our end of things, the Department of Sociology, the Masters of Human Rights Program, and the Conflict and Resilience Research Institute Canada, uh, Canada and its director, uh, Kazar Ahmed. So thanks to all of you for making this possible. Now we have this opportunity. Um, Sheila, you can, uh, I'll let you regulate the questions yourselves. Please put up your hand if you wanted to ask a question. Jason's got questions online. Just to invite people online to uh, raise their hand or put their question in the Q&A, and I will allow them to, to ask their question by using their voice over the form. Fantastic, Jason. Thank you. So go ahead, Sheila. Yeah, um, when you're talking about clothing, I mean, some of these things, issues seem to be subtle, but it's not like what... Um, so I was wondering, when people were taken to camps and stripped of their clothing, and then provided with other clothing, it would seem like an awful lot of extra labor on the part of the camp um, people to do that. So what was the purpose 
uh, of doing that? Was it to strip them of their own identity? Was it, what was, what was the point of doing that? It's a great question because I agree. It seems like a waste of time, right? That you're making them then go and get someone else's clothing. So there's a few reasons. They were stripped, honestly, for humiliation. So it's part of that, you know, degrading treatment. It's just another way that they can degrade and humiliate those people. Secondly, it was so that they could go through their belongings and steal anything of value. So for the Jews, they took anything they could find. Gold, they took their gold teeth out after they had killed them. Um, you know, any jewelry, any diamonds, any money, any valuables, um, you know, for example, Jews would have suitcases and they would sometimes, you know, they would pack a, a valuable menorah or something with them. So all of that type of stuff that, and, and so they wanted to take their clothing because not only could they have things in their pockets, but what the Jews were doing was sewing things into their clothes to hide them, to make sure that they were able to hang on to something valuable because they wouldn't know when they might need it to find their way out of somewhere. So they would sew things like into the hems of their clothes. Um, so that's one of the reasons. The third reason is that they would make them go and they would shave their head and they would make them go for delousing and showering. Um, so, um, or honestly, they would strip them and put them straight into the gas chambers. So interestingly, um, with some of the gas chambers, what they would do, the outer room where they would make them take their clothes off, it's all very organized and orderly. And they even had hooks on the walls with letters and they would say, you know, make sure you hang your items under the letter that corresponds with your surname so you know where to find it. And the idea behind that was to keep everyone calm and to make them think that they were going to come back out and retrieve their clothing when in fact they were going into the gas chambers. So it's a great question and yeah, so there's a few different reasons for that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that was very, I thought it was very original, actually, and, and very useful, so thank you for that. Oops. So one thing that occurs to me, uh, this is a more legal question, but as you're talking about the utility of looking at human rights violations in terms of human rights law uh, as identifying genocidal processes, but of course, genocide often takes place in the context of armed conflicts. Maybe not always, but very often. And then, of course, international humanitarian law is also applicable Maybe more applicable, depending on who you ask, in terms of this Lex Specialis debate. But I'm wondering, for example, uh, like something like a state of siege would probably be permissible under international humanitarian law, but maybe not so much under human rights law because it pertains to things like adequate standard of living and stuff like that. So I'm just kind of wondering how you square that angle of things, the fact that international humanitarian laws has a different logic which is not always very human rightsy in a sense. Yeah, I don't, I don't use IHL in great depth. I do mention it a couple of times, particularly when I say this would also, like the same rules apply under IHL. Um, but I don't go into it because I want my discussion to be applicable in, in non-conflict situations as well. Um, but I mean, the fact is that human rights still apply during conflict. Um, with the exception of those rights that are derogable. But the rights that I'm talking about, the majority of them are non-derogable, with the exception of freedom of expression. But also, the derogations permitted on freedom of expression are still limited as well. So I think that this would still work. I mean, your question about siege, I mean, siege is technically not unlawful per se under IHL, but it's moving in that direction and it's so highly regulated that it's not really seen as something acceptable. Um, but I think that, yeah, it's, it's a good question actually, but I still think that you would be able to balance most of the, uh, the rights that I'm talking about as being non-derogable rights. So for, just for non-lawyers, could you explain derogability? Because sure. like that's a technical, <laughs> very much a technical sure. term. So um, <laughs> derogable means that you, well, when it, most rights are non-derogable, which means they exist all the time and no country can make any changes to those. Some of them are derogable during times of emergency, such as conflict or public health emergencies, 
So we've all witnessed that over the past few years, the permissibility of limiting human rights, specific human rights, during times of emergency, such as um, conflict or other public health emergencies. So it says that because this is needed, it's okay to do that. Um, but certainly many rights are non derogable like the right of well, the right to life is a different, is it, and IHL is a different thing, which I talk about. Um, but yeah, it's basically say, thinking about because the IHL, international humanitarian law, is a lex specialis, a special law that applies during armed conflict, there are certain things that are permissible during armed conflict that wouldn't normally be permissible. And so therefore, you can derogate those rights and actually the right to life is one of them because it is actually permitted to kill people during armed conflict but that is not a blanket it's anyway it's, <laughs> that could be a whole other thing I, that's a part of my lectures that I give when I'm teaching but um, so for example freedom of expression can be derogated from um, because there are things that you don't necessarily want made public during armed conflict for national security reasons so that's one example um, but generally, most of them are not terrible. I hope that makes sense. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> I have an online question, and uh, Taufik, if you'd like to, I've, I've turned on your microphone. You're welcome to ask your question. If I don't hear from you, I'll read it for you. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Brien, for the lecture. I really appreciate all the information that you said about the human rights, because so far as I'm a student and studying, uh, human rights has not been looked at it in this way as a way in terms of genocide studies. I appreciate that because I, I had the privilege of reading your book and I was impressed, especially in the chapter about the Armenian genocide. When you're talking about examining the Armenian genocide, because the Armenian genocide, you, you're saying that it's not happened in 1915, but uh, happened much earlier in 1892 under the Sultan Abdul Hamid II, and then it uh, reached to the Young Turk is when uh, they had those atrocities against the Armenian. So it was, as you said in, at the beginning of your lecture, uh, it was a process. So the genocide is a process. But what's interesting here, how in the modern days for the future genocide in the downstream, uh, human rights could be used as a preventive measure to prevent uh, mass, at uh, mass atrocities. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad that you, you noticed that because, you know, we always talk about the Armenian genocide as 1915. Um, and, but actually, essentially, like many genocides, there are precursor massacres. So in the 1890s, there were what are known as the Hamidian massacres where um, thousands of Armenians were, were massacred at the time. And, and it's similar if you look at the Rohingya, for example, you know, I, I talk about 2017, but there were massacres in 2012. And prior to that, you know, several different uh, incidences of massacres over decades of time. Um, I don't want to say that all genocides have a process that is necessarily decades long, um, but often that is what we see. And I mean, Shell has, has written about slow burn genocides that take place over long periods of time. His piece is excellent. I highly recommend reading it. One of the best pieces that I've had the privilege of editing as a journal editor. The most no work to be done on it. Um, in terms of, yeah, the human rights system being used for prevention, I mean, I you know, I, I, I hope that my book is a good contribution to that idea and how it can be used by seeing that pattern rather than just simply generically calling out different human rights or a limited range of human rights that are taking place without actually looking at the pattern, um, which to me is missing the bigger picture of what is really taking place. Um, and I talk about, when I'm saying that, you know, I'm talking about human rights mechanisms like the UN, but also essentially I do mean states, countries as well, that they should be looking at this pattern and calling it out for what it is. This reluctance to use the, the word genocide when it is applicable. You know, at a minimum here, even if they were to say there's a significant risk of genocide, even that I'd be happy with, <laughs> you know, if they were midstream in this pattern. So I think 
you know, that needs to be to be recognized more. Madeline, if you'd like, uh, you can you can ask your question. If I don't hear your voice, I will read your question for you. Uh, it's a fairly concise question, so I'll read it. Uh, in establishing genocide in a human rights framework, is the motivation to encourage early prosecution for people who are experiencing the lead up to genocide? That's a great, great question. And uh, I do, as I said, I do want to make clear that I don't think it's the lead up to genocide. I think we're in the process already. And it's really interesting because, and, I, and this is not the first time I've been asked this, because then we're thinking about, well, genocide only happens when once we've got to the end and we've got to the killing. Um, and so, therefore, we should only prosecute after that stage has been done. Do we really want to wait for that stage? You know, my point is let's recognize it while we're in the process and do something about it. And punishment is a form of prevention. It's a really important form of prevention. So why not take action midway through the process instead of waiting until after, you know, thousands or even millions of people have been slaughtered? I, I, I think it comes as no surprise the timing of Henry Kissinger's um, passing and the whole notion of realpolitik. Um, and so recognizing the, the, the real power and, and power imbalance, and as you noted earlier, the resistance of utilizing this term, how can we present this argument in a way that is not seen as threatening uh, for those states that are in power, but actually upholding and strengthening um, a larger notion of, of good governance. Um, so speaking not necessarily to ideals, which don't always move powers, uh, but rather to base interest. Yeah, it's a good question. And also it's funny, you know, last week, I literally last week was talking with someone about Kissinger and I said, isn't he dead? And- uh, Never. <laughs> Yeah, and she said, no, no, he's still alive, but it turns out, you know, this week I was right, so, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, it's an interesting question, and, you know, I'm a lawyer, so not a, not a politician, not a political scientist, and I do struggle with the political side of it. Um, I, you know, I do lobbying work um, with the Armenians for genocide recognition in Australia and other countries, and it's really difficult. It's really difficult, and... I'm not very good at being diplomatic. I'm an academic, so I have freedom of speech. And I, as I get older, I have less qualms about speaking my mind. And that also comes from my experience of engaging with many survivor communities and seeing what they go through. And I'm very passionate about advocating for that. And so, you know, I see, I've been saying you should do it because it's the right thing to do. Um, but also other things are also legal obligations that states have to do. And so they should be complying with those obligations. And we need to be remembering that international law gives us a, actually a, a, a pretty good system, maybe not perfect, um, but a, a pretty good system for doing things about this, you know, whether it's a mid-stage, a late stage, or after something has happened. There is a structure there. There is a process for doing something about it. And for me, you know, I speak as a lawyer, so my emphasis is always on talking to states about what are their legal obligations, what are you obligated to do. So, for example, I was part of drafting a letter recently to the Australian government about its legal obligations um, in relation to the Israel us conflict and the focus was what are Australia's legal obligations under international humanitarian law and the genocide convention and that's where I come from and that's my perspective is communicating to them you have these obligations and you should be acting and doing this um, and in doing so you will demonstrate that you are a leader to the rest of the international community that you are a leader in upholding the law, but also by in, in doing the right thing and the things that you should be 
That's that's the way I see it, <laughs> as a, as a non-political scientist. <laughs> These have been, <clears throat> been amazing questions. We're actually um, at the end of time right now. What I would do is say if anybody's got a burning question that really needs to be asked at this moment, um, now would be the time to do that. Or else there's coffee and cookies in the room, certainly, and folks here would have an opportunity to just informally interact with Dr. O'Brien for a minute or two, I'm sure. So is there a burning question that uh, uh, somebody wants to ask? How was that? No, no, sorry. <laughs> then please join with me in thanking Dr. O'Brien for an incredibly stimulating okay. talk.